Hi folks, you're listening to the A Minute to Midnight show. My name is Tony. Today's guest on the show is Deputy Marty Breeden and what Marty shares with us today, a near-death experience and a couple of prophetic dreams he's had in the last two weeks or so are very, very sobering, very important and I believe we need to share them far and wide because time is very short and God has shared with Marty some very important warnings of what is to come. We welcome Deputy Marty Breeden to the A Minute to Midnight show. It's great to be chatting with you today, Marty. It's great to be with you, Tony. Thank you so much. I've been really looking forward to this. Uh, I've heard your testimony. I've read some other stuff that you've sent us recently. And I believe that on July 17th, 2015, you had a near-death experience and went code blue twice in, in about 48 hours. And during that time, the Lord spoke to you some pretty sobering words. Perhaps before we get into that, it would be good if you could give our listeners just a bit of a background into who you are and what you do and what led to your experience. Absolutely. Again, thank you for having me. Um I'm married. Uh, I have two daughters, uh, 27 and 13. Um, I've been a law enforcement officer for 10 years. And at the time this happened, I was working at the Newmarket Police Department as a police officer um, when this took place. Um, building up to that, I began to have some health issues. And um, that's what led to uh, to, to me having to go into the hospital. I can cover that now, Tony, or we can come back to that. Um, uh, yeah, no, that's good. You can go into that now if you want. Okay, yes, I'd been, I'd had um, undiagnosed sleep apnea. Uh, I'd had some other health issues uh, that were going on. And according to the doctors, uh, the perfect storm came together. I was having very, very labored breathing uh, lots of fatigue, wasn't for sure what was going on. Woke up the morning of July 17th, uh, sitting in the living room with labored breathing. Of course, I'm a cop. I'm a 10 feet tall, bulletproof. I don't need doctors, hospitals, or anything like that. Little did I realize that nothing could have been further from the truth at the time. Um, my wife walked into the living room that morning and she said, you look, you look sick. You, you need to go to the hospital. And Tony, when she said, I said, okay, she knew something was wrong then uh, because I normally would not go to the doctors. Um, we went to the hospital, and as I arrived at the hospital, um, they began to do tests on me because I was, I was just feeling very strange, feeling very lightheaded, um, very, very, very labored breath. And they began to do testing on me, and at some point, they did an EKG, uh, they did blood work, and they come back and they told my wife, we're not for sure what's going on with your husband, if he's had a heart attack or if he's going to have a heart attack or exactly what's going on, but the EKG is abnormal uh, as well as the blood work has come back abnormal as well. And so they continued um, to try to find out what was going on with me and I began to get worse and worse, and I went into what almost appeared to be like a seizure, and my wife said that they're, told them there's something wrong, there's something wrong with my husband, uh, he's not acting normal, I began to actually just, just talk out of my head, and at some point along that time, uh, for the first time, uh, I stopped breathing, and I went code blue, and um so then the resuscitation team come in it's because when you go code blue, you go into uh, cardiopulmonary arrest. And uh, that's exactly, exactly what happened to me. And um, so my wife was, was taken out of the room and they were then worked uh, to revive me. Um, I had to be, had to go on a respirator, ultimately had to have a tracheostomy uh, surgery. I wound up being in a coma and life support for two weeks, spent three weeks in the critical care unit, seven days in the progressive care unit, and then 
and we'll care, cover this in a little bit as well, but I was sent to the University of Virginia Transitional Care Facility uh, for 11 days at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville uh, to learn how to walk, to talk, and to swallow again, because at the time I was sent there, uh, I could do none of those things. Um, I was there, there for 11 days. Now, if we can, let's go back to the time, uh, the morning of July 17th, 2015, when I went to uh, Sentara RMH Hospital, and all of this can be medically documented. Um, when I went to Sentara that morning, and I went code blue the first time, and my wife heard it ring all throughout the hospital uh, that I was code blue, and they rushed into the room. She was escorted out. Um, and immediately, Tony, upon me going code blue, I left my body and I began to travel through a tunnel. And it is impossible with words to describe how fast. And I'm a cop. I know what it's like to go fast. But it's impossible to describe the speed, uh, even beyond the speed of thought, that I was going through this tunnel. Now, when I went through this tunnel... And keep in mind, nobody had any idea any of this was going on. As far as they knew, I was gone. As I went through the tunnel and I came out the other side, I have never been permission given permission to share the things that I saw in the first uh, Code Blue experience, but I was given a mandate to come back and tell what I heard. And when I came out of the, tu out of the tunnel, the very first thing I heard was the voice of the Lord, and it's undeniable and it's unmistakable, and you know exactly who it is. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. And I heard him say, my church does not believe that I'm coming back soon. Then he said it again with even more passion. He said, my church does not really believe that I'm coming back soon. Then, Tony, he said it yet again with more passion and more power, and he was even louder. And he said, my church does not really believe that I'm coming back soon. And at that point, I was almost like a school child. I started waving my hands and I said, Lord, 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 yet, yes, we do believe that you're coming back soon. We, we sing about it. We preach about it. We pray about it. We study about it. Lord, we do believe that you're coming back soon. And at this point, and I'm sorry, you're just going to have to bear with me just for a second. At this point, the timbre and the tone of his voice changed. And he said, my church does not really believe that I'm coming back soon. For if they did, they would not be living as they are. Then... He pointed his finger at me, and not in a mean way, but he wanted to get his point across. He pointed his finger at me. He said, I am coming back soon, and my church is not ready. And he said, go back and tell the things that you've heard, and it began to fade. And it's, he said, and know that your message will not be received. At that point, I came back into my body, and they resuscitated me. That's the scary part, is that the message not being received part, that's, yeah, I mean, I'm listening at the moment, kind of dumbfounded to a lot of people that are saying, oh, there's a reprieve and there's a man now that's going to slow everything down and we can all relax and go back to sleep. I, d I don't believe that for a second. Neither and, do and, I. <laughs> not, 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 not whatsoever. I think I think the die has been cast. Some of the dreams that we'll get into shortly, uh, I think the die has been cast, and I, and I don't think that the things have have slowed down slowed down whatsoever. But I heard heard the Lord say say those things. I I survived. Obviously, uh, I, I I laid in that uh, critical care unit for three weeks. Again, they, they sent me then to progressive care. Um, from there, they sent me to the University of Virginia uh, Transitional Care Facility. And when I was there, I'll get to the second part uh, of the vision. When I was there the first night, now, as the 
Apostle Paul said, whether in the body or out of the body, I, I don't know. The only thing I can report is, is what I saw and what I heard. Before I get to this part, I think it's important to, to point something out. When Jesus spoke, uh, he, he, when he spoke to his audience, he often spoke very clearly, and very succinctly. No, no, there was never any wiggle room with anything that he said. For example, John 14, 6, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There were other times that Jesus spoke to his target audience in a way that he knew they would understand. So in order to communicate his point adequately so that they would understand it, he would use parables, he would use symbols, and he would use illustrations to make sure that they knew exactly uh, what he was trying to say. And I think the Lord speaks to us the same way uh, often today in our dreams and visions and the things that he shows us. He will speak to us uh, he will be telling us he never contradicts his word. Our, his word is our final authority. But he may show you, Tony, something in a different way that he would show me. The message would be the same. But from an association standpoint, as the way the Lord would reveal that to us, he may show us things in a different way. Now, the first night that I arrived at the University of Virginia, uh, at the transitional care facility, uh, that, that night I had... Uh, a dream or a vision, I, again, as, as Paul said, whether in the body or out of the body, I'm not, I'm not for sure. But I, I, had, I had this vision, and I, I saw, it was almost like an aerial view, that there was a, a small oval-shaped light that looked like it was the shape of an egg. Now, just based on, I had to qualify with what I said just a few minutes ago for this, for this to make sense. This light began to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until all of a sudden I realized that I was standing in the middle of a huge football stadium and there was no one there and it was nighttime. And I looked up at the scoreboard in this vision. I looked up at the scoreboard and it said 213. And I immediately heard that same voice when I coded the first time. I immediately heard that voice. The voice of the Lord said, my church should be living as though this is the two minute warning. I immediately woke up. God, obviously knowing that I'm a huge football fan, that would make perfect sense to me. And that last two minutes in a football game and that last 120 seconds, uh, you're, you do all that you can to build a strong opposition, to score as many points, to gain as many yards. If you're winning the game, you build up a strong defense. You keep the enemy from scoring yards, from scoring points, from making progression. And you do all that you can to make a one last final push because the referee is about to blow the whistle and the game is about to be over. And I knew exactly what the Lord meant when he said my church should be living as though this is the two minute warning. Now keep in mind that a, a few hours later, I was in a wheelchair at the time this took place and I was in my hospital room and I was looking out the window and I was thinking about this amazing visitation that I had had just a few just a, just a, a, a few hours earlier and I was looking out my window and there was a knock at my door and I could barely speak because I still had part of the part of the trach in and I said I said come in and there were two ladies that walked in and they were obviously part of the medical staff uh, they had their medical medical gowns on and and they walked in and they said, Mr. Breeden, uh, can we speak with you? And I said, of course you can. So they came in and they introduced themselves and uh, they, they sat down and one lady introduced herself. She said, she gave me her name and she said, Mr. Breeden, I will be your physical therapist while you're here with us. And she introduced the other girl and she said, and she will be your occupational therapist. She said, you've been in law enforcement and some things may change. You've been through a lot, uh, but we want, want to talk to you about, uh, about your transition and about your recovery and some of the things that we're going to propose doing. And we did that and we spoke for a few moments. And then, Tony, the conversation took a very odd turn. The physical therapist looked at me and she said, Mr. Breeden, can I ask you a personal question? I said, oh, of course you can. And she said, would you consider yourself a man of faith? And I said, well, I certainly haven't always lived it. I've not always been the best example, but yes, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. And, I, and she looked at the other lady and they smiled at one another. And I said, ladies, I said, I could barely talk. I said this pretty much through a whisper. 
I said, I'm not at all offended by your question. I said, but that's kind of an odd question for a physical therapist to ask a patient, isn't it? And she said, let me tell you something, Mr. Braden. She said, we had no intentions of coming in seeing you this morning. She said, and the other girl's name was Becky. She said, Becky and I were going to see other patients this morning. We passed in the hall. She was going one way and I was going the other way. She said, and as we were past, she said, we are both spirit-filled Christians. We are both followers of Jesus. She said, and we, we hear from the Lord. She said, as we were passing in the hall, she said, when we got in front of your door, she said, just as it was superimposed in the spirit, we both saw the number two on your door. And she said, I looked. And I said, do you see that? And she said, the other girl said, yes. She said, Lord, what does that mean? She said, the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, go in and ask that man if he knows what the number two means, and he'll know exactly what you're talking about. They came in and she said, Marty, what, what does that mean? And I told her that only hours later that I had had that vision and exactly what had taken place. And we were all astonished in a million years. It would be impossible uh, to make that up. And it was just absolutely amazing. I was able to tell her what I heard, what the church should be doing. Uh, and so I, I was able to share in, in such a beautiful way. The fact, let me fast forward a little bit. God did a miraculous. They, they called me at, at the transitional care facility. They called me the miracle man because I had coded twice and there was no reason for me to be here. And I would often tell them when they would say that, I would say, no, I'm not the miracle man, but I do happen to know him, happen to know him very well. Yeah. Yeah. So when I come, when I come out of the hospital, I began to put all this together. I called several friends of mine uh, and, and told them some of the things that I had seen, some of the things I had heard and what had taken place. But over the next while, I began to recover. And Tony, just as it happened in the Code Blue experience the very first time, when the Lord said, my church does not really believe that I'm coming back soon, and he gave me that message, and the last thing he told me before I came back into my body is to know that your message will not be received. That first year, I probably told over 50 pastors. I didn't go public with it. I discreetly would, would get pastors and I would tell them. And they're out of those pastors, out of all of those men, men that I had known for a long time, men that I had trusted, men that I had in the past even ministered with, not a single one of those men asked me to share that with my with their church. Only one disabled pastor in a backwoods little country church asked me to come share what the Lord had, had shown me. And I went to that church and did it. And we had a powerful move of God and people got saved that morning. But the truth can only be hidden, but so long. And after about a year, God began to open doors and break down the barriers. And it's, it's interesting because one of the first times then that I was going to speak about this in a large church publicly uh, was, was August of 2015. It's only been a few months back. And a week before I was to go preach, I was sitting in my living room, and my 13-year-old daughter was only— Can I just interrupt a, for a second? Sorry, was it 2015 or 2016? I think you said 2015. It was 2015, yes. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, so when I was sitting, it was—this was—, this was um, this when the event happened in 2015, but I but but what I'm about to share happened in 2016 because I carried that for a year and just told the pastors and just shared with them, uh, and it seemed like no doors were opening at all. And in August of 2016, God began to break open some barriers and began to open doors for me to go out and share. And I had sat on this thing for a year with with no one receiving it, just as the Lord had told me. I would get very frustrated at times when I would come home and I would tell my wife, I don't understand this. This is a word for the church, and, I, and I'm not for sure what's going on. And my wife would say, well, the Lord told you that the message would not be received. But finally, a pastor asked me to come to his church, and he said, I want you to tell uh, everything that you saw and everything that you heard, because it's a word that the church needs to hear, and much of the church is asleep, and please come share this with my church. So about a week before, Tony, I was preparing, and I remember I was sitting in my living room, 
with my daughter uh, and she was doing something and and I was just just seeking the Lord and and, and I, I took I took something to the Lord. I said, Lord, I, one thing I've never understood, I understand about your church not really believe that you're coming back soon. And I said, I understand the, the two minute warning. I said, but one thing that I've grappled with and I've never quite understood, Lord, will you will you will you show me this? It's kind of a missing piece of the puzzle for me. And, and the details, I'm, I'm a police officer. Details are a big deal to me when I when I report things. And so I said, Lord, I've never quite understood. Well, when I looked at the scoreboard, well, why did I see 213? I, under, I understand what you said, that the church should be living as though this is the two-minute warning. I get that. But why did I see 213? And Tony, as I sat here before you telling this story, the voice of the Lord spoke to me, and he said, turn to the book of Titus. And I read out of the King James Version. But he said, turn to the book of Titus. Look at chapter 2 and read verse 13. And I'm going to do that right now. This is what Titus 2.13 says. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Definitely not coincidental, that's for sure. So how, sure. how have things actually changed then in your life since this happened? It has been it, it has been phenomenal because since August of 2016, since I began speaking publicly about what happened in July of 2015, the Lord has now begun to open doors. Word has begun to spread, and everywhere I go, every church that 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 is that opens the doors, and they're opening quite a bit locally now. Every church that I go to, I see young and old coming to know Christ, people literally running to the altar. It is not not a, a fearful message, but it is indeed a warning, a very loving warning uh, to, the, to the church. And when I go and share this, I have stood beside people at the altar, weeping, people weeping at the altar, and I have led seven-year-old young children to the Lord right alongside 70-year-old people. It's absolutely astonishing how the Lord uses this to move upon his people. And I think I think it's a very real thing when people hear the testimony live and they realize that Jesus is coming soon. Yes. Well, well you know, it, it is kind of sobering. It can, it, it, I mean, it's exciting and it's scary at the same time because, it, you know, so many of us have to examine our lives and just as you would have had to do at that point and go, well, what are we actually doing? If this is the truth, if the Lord is coming back really soon, what's he going to find us doing when he returns? That's, that's true. And something that I don't often share if I'm, if I'm, I'm speaking with someone, but I, but I, but I want to say this because I think it's important. Very few people know what it's like to lay in a hospital bed in the critical care unit and literally not know from hour to hour whether you're going to be around. And you lay there and you grapple with the thought, have I fulfilled the purposes of God for my life? And at that point in time, Tony, I could not say that I had because I knew God had given me much to do and I had done very little of it. And since then, I'm still a full-time police officer. Uh, but since then, every time the Lord opens a door and I can work it out to go, and I do this often, pretty much about, and I, and I try to stay plugged into my home church as well. But I, when there's a door open, I go and share. And when I share, I see lives change. And it's, it's changed my whole perspective on how I, how, how I live. And, and prophetically, there's so many things happening. And I'm a cop. I'm not a, I, I make no professions to be a prophet or a theologian or any of those things. But my eyes are wide open to what's going on in the world right now. And I believe that we are living in those times that the Bible calls perilous times. So, you know, you're a cop. Um, one thing, I mean, I wonder how that's being, your, what your testimony is here, how's that being accepted within law enforcement? Because they must know you're now out there speaking this stuff. And secondly, when you are doing your job as a law enforcement officer, you must have to face some pretty scary times where you don't really know what the outcome of what you're called out to do is going to be. So in a sense, you could face death any day. That is an excellent point. And, I, and, I, and I'm really glad that you made that. And, and I appreciate you saying that because that's so true. Often uh, people really have no idea what happens uh, and what goes through a police officer's mind and their heart when you get what we refer to as a hot call. 
when you have a domestic in progress and there are weapons involved. And you do, you wonder, is this my last call? What's going to happen? And but but as far as being received by law enforcement, I have to say that the Lord has given me, Tony, he has given me great favor. I've had an opportunity to to, to pray with other police officers. I've had an opportunity to share this testimony. And it's, 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 you always open yourself to being, I understand, mocked and ridiculed and not received in this world. But the Lord has given me great favor among law enforcement. And they, and they, and they show me, they show me quite a bit of honor. And, and I'm really, really thankful to the Lord for that. Yes, that's amazing, actually. And it's so good. So good to hear that. Now, um, recently, also, you've sent um, to a minute to midnight team members, um, Brooke Ardoin and Joni Stahl, I think a couple of dreams prof- that you believe are prophetic that you've received in very recent times. I'd kind of like to get into them here because whilst your testimony of the near death experience is really amazing, actually, so are these dreams because I've I've read them. So perhaps you could go into that here. Absolutely. Um, it seems that I've, I've dreamt, had dreams um, prophetically f- for a while, but nothing to the degree uh, that I've seen lately with with the imagery and the and the detail and the the things that I think uh, that are that are coming upon this nation and upon this world. And on December eighteenth, two thousand sixteen, uh, just just a few weeks ago, uh, I had a dream and I saw a funeral. And I saw an American flag flying high up on the post. And I was waiting and waiting in this dream for a funeral to start. And I was gazing up into the clouds and I saw the American flag and it was free. It was it was flying freely. And then where I was standing, this funeral procession uh, began to take place. It began to start. And I was asked by someone to stand beside the casket uh, of the deceased. Uh, I told the officials that were there that the funeral could not start yet and that they were not ready to start the funeral because the casket had not been sealed. I then very clearly heard the voice of the Lord say, stand back away from the casket for the rock will fall and seal it. And of course, normally the caskets would be sealed as, as called for in the protocol. But on this occasion, a huge rock fell from the top of the post onto the onto the American flag that was already loosely draped over the coffin and sealing it with great force. And the rock remained on top of this coffin. The officials handling this funeral were obviously, by my perception, I could tell that they were drunken and they were ill-prepared and they were not ready uh, to have this funeral. In fact, they were mocking. They were disheveled. I could hardly believe that their, their lack of concern over what was happening in this sacred event. And I remember thinking as we were all standing there dressed in our black attire, our black funeral attire, am I the only one that's taking this passing serious? Why aren't these other men that are the supposed professionals uh, doing their job properly? And why are they taking it so lightly? I remember thinking, I'm a cop. Why are they not doing their job? And Tony, the only thing that I could really say that that from an interpretation standpoint uh, that I feel that this has to do with is that I think that, that the professional church is still standing back and they are drunken with the things of the world and they clearly see the death all around them, that, but they do not take it serious. They do not count the cost. And, and often, sadly, they don't even seem to care. And regardless, the rock is about to fall on America and seal it in a way that no one ever expected. And I think the ones standing around and watching guard at this time are not the professionals, it's, but it is the no-named, seemingly out-of-place persons that are clearly hearing the rock is about to fall and are going to be heeding the warning until they hear the Lord say exactly as he did to me, step back now. And I believe something's coming, Tony, and I think it's big and it's sudden and it's going to be life-altering. Yes, that's sobering. I have to say, um, when I hear that too, I think of the rock and the rock being Christ. I also, yes. um, I also think about the whole situation that's going on in Israel at the moment and the potential dividing of Israel and America's role in that. And I'm wondering whether that's the thing that triggers it. I'm not saying that I'm correct there, but that's the thoughts that go through my mind. I think I think you're spot on, and I've got a, I've had another dream on on the fourth of January of 2017, just just um, well last week, 
And but but to your point, I, I think you know January the fifteenth uh, could be a day uh, I think that could change the world that we live in because seventy nations are gathering uh, in France and their their basic topic of discussion is going to be a two state solution: how to divide the land of Israel and how to divide the city of David, Jerusalem. And we know in Zechariah 12 and in Ezekiel and another in Joel, God has said, do not touch my land, do not divide my land. And I think whoever participates in, in that, God will divide their land. And I think because America has been such a staunch ally uh, with Israel, God, obviously, I will tell Abraham, I will bless those that bless you and I, and I will curse those that curse you. And I think that if America goes through with this, that we are going to see a dividing of our land. And one of the dreams that the dream that I had uh, on the fourth, uh, if if this comes to pass, what I saw in this dream, and I and I can share it any at any time now. Yep. Uh, we are in, we are in for some really really hard times. I've seen that dream. I think Brooke sent it to me or Joni, one of the other of them. And um, I think you should read it because, yeah, it's definitely one of those ones that are, again, very powerful. Okay. On the 4th of January, 2017, uh, I recall being escorted with my family to a very tall, high-rise building. The view was stunning as we looked over a huge city. The city was full of people and residential houses and businesses, and we were led there by a close friend of mine who is an airline pilot. As we stood in this building that was full of glass and looking down over the city below, we suddenly heard a weather report that there were tornadoes approaching. We looked down upon the city and there was a large tornado forming. It then developed into a full-blown massive tornado. Then there was another, then there was another, and now yet there was another. I counted at least four to five simultaneous tornadoes that were massive in size and destruction, and they were wiping out everything in their path. One odd thing was that they all ran together in one accord. They did not get ahead or behind the other, and it appeared as though they were a wall of tornadoes working together, yet they were spinning independently of one another. I knew this city was in huge trouble, it was very flat and the destruction was very swift and completely absolute. And just as I was about to take cover with myself and my family, I suddenly saw very large fireballs coming down from the sky with huge smoke trails behind them. When the fireballs would hit, they would literally burn up, almost vaporizing their target. I remember the power went out in the building that we were in. Mass panic began to set in everywhere because there appeared that there was nowhere to run and hide from this onslaught of destruction. I remember running to a corner of the room with my daughter, trying to shield her from the bullets that rang out. I'm a cop. I know the sound of this. It put holes in the wall behind us where we were. They were that close, yet we were not harmed. I could tell that if these fireballs, I could not tell whether these fireballs were either natural or man-made. I could not tell if they were meteors or if they were nuclear weapons, and it really didn't matter because the destruction and the end result was the same. I remember waiting for the sounds of destruction to pass as I covered my daughter. I went below to see this thing for myself. And I cannot with words describe the fear and the bewildered look on people's faces. One man in particular who was very well dressed, seemingly at one point, he was well-dressed, well-groomed. He was in complete shock, and he was weeping. He appeared as though he wanted to ask questions, but he seemed unable to even ask a question as he staggered around. I saw people running everywhere, looking for loved ones, looking for food, looking for protection, and yes, even looking for something to defend themselves. The landscape was totally destroyed. Every building had been leveled and dust and smoke filled the air. What had been a hustling and bustling city, beautiful city just moments prior, was now a desolate, ruinous heap. The panic that I saw in the people was beyond anything I had ever witnessed. The stark terror and confusion in their faces is literally beyond comprehension. I walked through the city until I could no longer stand to see the pain anymore, and I decided that I would begin to make my way back toward my own family. As I did, it was then that I looked up into the sky 
and I saw fighter jets filling the skies. But because of the smoke and the fog of the destruction, I could not tell whether they were friend or foe. I then awoke. Wow. Yeah, that's powerful as well. And, you know, I guess for people um, hearing these sort of things, it's, it can be quite scary um, even hearing about it and wondering what does that mean for them and how do we process this and you know many people will rather go back to sleep and think I don't want to hear it don't want to know I just want to carry on my life and then there'll be other people that go this is really very sobering God what do we do with this so what do you think we should be doing with this I think spiritually we need to be have our eyes wide open right now that, that we are living, uh, as the times are prophesied, uh, we are living in perilous times. I think the coming of the Lord is near. Um, from a logistical standpoint, um, I'm not a fear monger by any means, but I recommend that families do what they can to prepare themselves, to prepare for if that moment comes, to where there there is a time that we experience great tragedy and something would happen to where martial law would be declared. Um, I think that it would make sense to have a supply of food and water put back, um, a way to take care of yourself, to try to join with those that are like-minded. But again, the main thing spiritually is to make sure that our hearts are right before God, make sure that we are doing what we can to close ourselves in with the Lord and and hear from heaven and to try to walk uprightly. And I'm going to interject this, do all that we can, do all that we can to walk upright before the Lord and obey him in the smallest of things, because we're really going to need to hear his voice right now. There are a lot of voices out there speaking and a lot of people saying a lot of different things. And, And and I think it's, it's, it's very important that we, we first look to the word, obviously, but the, that there are times that the Lord will speak to us and, and, and we need to hear, hear that voice and, and be obedient. But anything that is keeping us from performing the will of God in our lives right now, set those things aside and do what God has called you to do. So do you think there is deception in the church today, um, a message of peace and safety uh, in general? Where's the church at? Um, is it a, is it where it should be, or is it as you had in your first what you first covered the near death experience? Is it basically going on and not going to listen as a whole? I, I, I don't. I, I said I say this sadly. I, I don't. I don't think that. And I will speak. I can really only speak about the American pulpit, but the American pulpit. It seems the vast majority. Do not want to preach the whole counsel of God. We want to pre and and thank God, Tony, for grace and mercy and the love of the Lord and that His mercies are new every morning. Praise the Lord for that. You and I wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't for that love and mercy. However, the full counsel of God also brings warning. It speaks of judgment. It speaks of hell. It speaks of things that most people are not comfortable talking about. So those things are, are, are not being spoken from behind the American pulpit. And I think most people, unfortunately, and, and I, don't, I don't say this with any pride or arrogance, God search my heart, but most of our churches today are nothing more than a social club. And people do not want to believe that the Lord's coming soon. They do not want to believe that trouble is coming. And so most, the best thing that, that these are the thing that these people choose to do is stick their head in the sand and just say, oh, I don't believe that's going to come or that's that's just that's a weird dream or that's a weird experience. But I'm telling you, these things are upon us. These things are coming. And I, I don't know that I believe that as a whole, the church will turn. But God will always have his remnant, Tony, of people who will listen to him and people who will follow him. But I believe that there's persecution coming. But I, I think that there will be a, a powerful outpouring of the Lord as well to raise up people that will boldly proclaim his word and they will not love their lives under the death. And what would you say to somebody that's listening to this that doesn't have any um, relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and, and is wondering what do they do? If, if someone is listening to all that they've heard, and I've spoken some very hard things, the first thing that you need to realize 
is is that Jesus loves you. That's such a such a a, a quaint saying often. And, and I and, but I want you. I want want those people to know that Christ came and He died and He gave His life as a ransom for that person. And it's 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 a relationship. If we come to the Lord, if you come to the Lord humbly and say, Lord, I've heard some things today and I don't really understand all that's going on. But, Lord, I sent you knocking at my heart's door. Lord, would you forgive me for my sins? Would you come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior? Lord, I accept the sacrifice that you made. I believe that you died for me. Forgive me for my sins. Prepare me for eternity whenever that may come. And, Lord, help me to be ready and write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life so that when I stand before you, I can stand before you as your child. Absolutely. And so is this whole experiences that you've been having has it really changed the way that you're approaching your own life and the way you're living it has changed everything it absolutely has i i I think you know every pretty much every decision that i make right now is is a calculated one based on where i believe that we are prophetically based on the things uh that i that i've seen it has it's changed my family's life um I would I, I caution people draw close to your families drop a fence you know d- do all that you can to make things right with your family uh, because I believe that if we are in the two minute morning as I was told that this thing's about ready to wrap up and it's time to get the sin out of our lives time to get the junk out of our lives and it's time to follow the Lord would you like to actually um, pray for our listeners at this point I absolutely would and folks, if you're listening to me right now and, and you don't know Christ as your Savior, the Word tells us in Romans 10, 9, and 10 that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. For with the mouth confession is made in salvation, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So I want to I pray with you. And if you don't know this Jesus, know the things that you have heard, yes, is in fact, is a warning, but also know that he loves you. And he created you to have relationship with him. And you know deep in your heart that something's missing if you don't have him. And he is knocking at your heart's door right now. And I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you repeat these words after me and you mean them in your heart, then the Lord will come in and he will write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you will be saved for all eternity and you will be given eternal life. So just pray with me. Dear God in heaven. I come to you in Jesus' name. Forgive me for my sins and the life that I have lived. Lord, I come to you with everything I have, the good, the bad, the falls, the failures. But I ask you to forgive me, Lord, and come into my heart and to be my Lord and to be my Savior and write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And from this moment on, I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I'm just going to add a little prayer, a bit of prayer here myself. Lord, I just pray for those of us that do know you, whose walks are not on fire for you the way that they should be, for, who, whose hearts are divided, uh, who aren't 100% committed. Give us a fire, Lord. Give a fire in our bones, fire in our heart to actually live the way we should be living. Lord, to put you first and to let the things of the world fall off. I pray for all those listening that are lukewarm, that they would become hot rather than lukewarm. I pray for all of us, Lord, that we would be impacted by not just this message, but all more deeply by your Spirit, that it would be your Holy Spirit working in us, that would convict us, that would draw us closer to you, and that would give us the testimony of Jesus Christ to give to the world, the power of Jesus Christ, the love of Jesus Christ, and the certainty of the future return of the Lord Jesus Christ, that this will become our passion. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Do you have any final words that you'd like to share with people before we wrap this up, Marty? No, I really appreciate your time and appreciate your passion and so often it seems like we get so serious about a lot of other things and we find out that they really don't matter. 
what, what really matters is walking upright before the Lord and being ready uh, because we're going to see in the very near future uh, some things. We're going to turn on that TV one day and it's going to say breaking news and it's going to say special report. And when that happens, it's going to strike fear in the heart of many people. And we need to be ready and know that these things have been foretold. And God is warning people right now, Tony. He's sending out the message. He's getting out his message every way that he can so that no man will ever be able to step back and say, but I had no idea. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, this has been powerful. Um, I've been impacted by the show. I'm sure many people will be impacted by this so i want to thank you so very much for um coming on the show today marty and also um keep us up to date if god gives you any more prophetic dreams and warnings and things as well make sure you send them through to us i will do that tony it's been great spending time with you god bless you and thank you for all you do and bless you too I think the importance and urgency of today's message should speak pretty much for itself. We have all our shows and articles on the aminutetomidnight.com website and some of the other shows we have had recently also echo extremely important warnings. So if you haven't checked out the aminutetomidnight.com website recently, you probably should do so. Um, And subscribe to this YouTube channel is probably a good idea too. We do regularly post new videos and new articles on the website and also we are funded by donations and we really do appreciate people that help us that way to keep this running to keep the shows running and the articles coming so to those um, that do help us with donations we're very very grateful Uh, that's probably about it for today oh one more thing i write and record and play all the music on our shows so this song underneath is my playing and you can find all my music at rockshoresounds.com that's royalty free production music and sound effects and there is a link to that on the aminutsamidnight.com website so that's it for this show this is Tony signing off <laughs>